please welcome to our first panel today. We have uh, with us Melody Lang, who is a co-founder and CEO of uh, Bloom Learning. Uh, we have Yolanda Golani, who is our director of uh, learning innovation at IE Business School. Uh, Roman Breger, who is managing director at Spider. And this panel will be uh, moderated by Carla Arts, who is an international edtech expert and strategist coming to us from the UK. So, Carla, are you here? Carla, Carla, Carla. That's what I was looking at. I'm like, I can't see Carla. I can't see <gasps> Carla. I, I've kept, you know, oh. scrolling at all the names. I'm like, where is Carla? No. Oh, come on. Okay. So, so Carla then. <laughs> but, but anyways, we were going to start with five minute introductions each. So, Okay. Maybe that gives her time to get started and you can ping her in the meantime, because for us in the UK, it's not 10, it's nine. And maybe that, you know, it took me a while to, oh gosh, no, it's actually nine, not 10 to start, you know? <gasps> okay. So okay. I don't know, because she's UK based, that might have been the confusion, but I don't know. Yeah, I'll try to catch her. Okay, so we have Melody, we have Samantha and we have Roman. So all three of you, you're here. Uh, in that case, I will uh, I will moderate the beginning. And uh, Melody, would you like to start with your presentation then? Yes. Okay, let's do that. So it's not so much a presentation. Yeah, an introduction. So who am I, basically? Mm -hmm. A bit more on my background and uh, my journey and why am I here today um, talking in front of you. So um, by background, I'm a mathematician and research scientist. Uh, after my PhD in mechanical in engineering, though, I realized I had such a strong passion for education that I wanted really to take part in the transformation the whole industry is going through, was and is still going through. And I thought EdTech could be a good fit for my profile. At that time, one EdTech company that was making a lot of noise um, was Newton with a K. So um, a lot of you are, you know, off camera, but raise your hands for those who know who Newton is. K-N-E-W-T-O-N, okay. So, um, they uh, are headquartered in New York, raised $150 million and uh, developed what I would say uh, the state of the art adaptive learning engine. So to make learning personalized and fully personalized. So see it as an API layer that would embed into any e-learning solution to make learning uh, personalized. So that if you and me go on the same course online, we're gonna see different content in real time because of their super powerful algorithms behind the scene. So that was Newton. I stayed with them for four years. I was the first hire outside of the US for the London office. So I was, I was based in London. Tremendous learning experience on both product side and the challenges. A startup in that space trying to you know, scale and be global. And um, they had a lot of traction because they had huge massive deals with Pearson, the publishers. So that enabled them to get so, so much data so they could refine their algorithms. So, well, so Newton is a whole story. From there, I was then approached by a fund to set up their investment vehicle dedicated to EdTech because they wanted someone with industry expertise and network. That's how Edvinca was set up as a joint venture between two funds. Sadly, the founding partners could not agree on strategy. So I left to set up my own and that's how MPA education was born. And we deployed capital in 10 companies dedicated to the future of learning, talent and work. We were primarily focusing on both corporates and consumer markets. And maybe that's going to be one of the things we're going to discuss today. Why? It's because it's really hard to sell to schools and universities. So as an investor, that's kind of the direction you're taking, which is a real shame. So maybe that's something you could address on that you know, uh, panel today. So that's MP Education, still um, up and running, led um, by my lead investor, actually, as in managed by my lead investor. So I could jump into more back into an operator role where my heart is, really be hands on. And uh, I'm now co founding Bloom, Bloom Learning, and officially kicked things off in April. So we're still very early, but. I've got three other co-founders. We're a team of four co-founders and then, and then another four team members. So we're now a team of eight. And um, okay, I'll, I'll jump straight into like what, what we're doing because I think that's, that's part of the introduction of who am I. Now Bloom, 
um, we want to help learners. So it's, it's a learner centric solution and help learners navigate the vast amount of resources and content that is out there in the most efficient way. So whether from formal to informal learning and put everything in the mix and build that holistic learner profile around all the content they're already consuming on a daily basis, whether they're listening to a podcast or attending a Coursera module at night or even in their more formal studies at uni. So how can all of that be part of a lifelong learning journey that we can keep track of and help them um, learn how to learn? So, so at, at the core of our solution are two things. One, the social learning aspect to it all, the sharing and discussing to develop your critical thinking skills, but also to empower you as a learner, put you in the driver, driving, yeah, driver's seat and uh, give you those tools, um, helping you to learn how to learn basically that we, we, we felt has kind of been missed somehow at, at school. And, and yeah, I think that that could be the key to unlock their learning journey. So maybe I'll stop here because I'm sure we'll go into more detail later on. Thank you very much, Melody. Well, I must uh, tell you all that I, uh, since, since I talked to, to Melody for the first time, I fell in love with Bloom and I'm using it myself now. So I uh, recommend you all to, to go, go on and, and check it. Uh, it's uh, still in the, in the trial period, right? So you're still developing it and adding new features, which is great as well because you can um, influence what they are doing over there and tell them what you need. I still have Carla is with us. Um, hi, Carla. Thank you so much. And uh, apologies, Melody. Um, so, um, no. so yes, uh, could I ask uh, Roman to um, do his presentation now, please? So good morning, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here. Thank you, Milena. Thank you, EETN and IE University and also Carla for having us here this morning. So my name is Roman. I'm uh, spearheading the Swiss at the Collider a uh, co-working space for education technology startups based here in, uh, in Lausanne. This is in the background, you can see that is the UPFL campus here in Lausanne, Switzerland. And we are based here in the ecosystem of uh, the academic sciences, but also the innovation park of uh, this uh, hub and center for education learning sciences here in Switzerland. So um, a little bit the similar path than Melody just explained. So my background is I was in the growing up in the financial world here in Switzerland. Then at one point I got a little bit fed up with, uh, with all the numbers and I moved uh, from Switzerland to the San Francisco Bay Area for quite a while, eight in total. And this is where I came in touch with education and specifically at ed tech. Of course, uh, Silicon Valley is a hub for ed tech uh, companies. I then worked for uh, international schools. So I got in touch with the back end basically of the ed tech side. And then I started working also for ed tech companies, uh, software as a service company, a global company, providing a platform for all the IB schools. For those who are working with IB schools, maybe Manage Back rings a bell. So that was the company I used to work for for uh, quite a while. And then I transferred to Khan Academy. And Khan Academy might also ring a bell with some of you guys. Um, you know, famous for their online learning platform, but also they have actually a brick and mortar school, which was a really interesting concept um, because this is a student driven learning experience for the students attending there. So they would basically um, join their own learning path in their own time frame, setting milestones with teachers and the teachers opposed to what we know as the general role of teachers as being as a front uh, speaker, they acted as coach, uh, coaches or mentors, which was a very interesting experience because with the help of technology and the student driven learning, we could see that the motivation basically of the students did go uh, through the roof at the end of the day. Coming back to Switzerland from San Francisco, um, I started working for the Swiss at the Collider, as I said, here in Lausanne in uh, 2017. And so what is uh, the Swiss at the Collider? The Swiss at the Collider is basically uh, a hub, as I mentioned already, and center for edtech startups. As you all know, education and specifically the education 
uh, market, the ad tech market is very complex matter. So it's a highly fragmented market with quite a few larger ad tech organizations, but mostly lots are small ad tech entities providing niche market products and innovations. So for you, it's very difficult, uh, you know, to find uh, a respective tool to implement if you want to better support the learning process, uh, because the market is so huge. According to a study of last year, there are more than 15,000 edtech startups out there. And I'm sure that during COVID now, a lot more uh, have popped up. And also there is no real IKEA catalog where you can just go to and find your respective tool. So this is where here four years ago, professors and learning specialists in uh, learning sciences decided to create a hub and center for education startups in order to be able firstly to meet other like-minded peers because there were no such thing as a common space for edtech startups where they can basically learn from each other, exchange experiences and best practices, but also to provide them visibility and create an edtech market so that we have the providers, the edtech startups, but then we also have the, the organizations, the learning institutions, specifically also the schools that are looking for solutions. So we bring these basically together. And how do we do that? We have a physical co-working space. Uh, this is this one here in the back. It should change any second. This is the physical co-working space at the ÖPFL that we have. So we have an open co-working space where we do uh, so-called collisions, hence the name Swiss EdTech Collider. So we bring people together. Collisions are, is basically a synonym for events that we do here. We have done more than 170 events since the inauguration in April 2017, where we basically bring together uh, or connect our startups with schools, with organizations, with chief learning officers from large corporations, education departments, and also people from the politics and more. So during those past three years, we basically have created an image and a brand for the startups which are members for us. So for them, it's easier to get into touch with schools. Melody mentioned it, that's one of the uh, big, big obstacles or hurdles for startups to get into touch with schools, specifically uh, public schools. But the, currently the 80 startups we have in the Swiss Sector Collider based on the fact that we have created this reputation and image along the way since 2017, have it a little bit easier to get in touch with uh, schools and educational institutions. But this is just the inside view. The outside view, we also have ties and connections to investors all around the world uh, where startups can get funding for different stages. We have schools, higher education schools, as well as, as larger corporations who act as test beds, uh, meaning they open the doors for startups so they can go in there and test their innovations with students, with teachers, with employees, so they get the real life feedback. So it's a win-win situation for both sides, we feel. We also have links to uh, EPFL, uh, Learning Sciences divisions with their background in learning sciences so that startups can go and discuss specific issues with uh, specialists, so whether it's methodological approaches or pedagogical approaches or issues. So in some cases, they can also have their uh, basically uh, innovation validated. And in the outer uh, stakeholder circle, we also have built a network and are continuously building out our network by partnering with other hubs. Obviously we're part of the EETN and also we are a digital innovation hub uh, in EdTech by the European uh, Commission since uh, May uh, this year, as an example. So having said that all, what we do is we help to push uh, the digital transformation in education, whether it's in schools or in organizations, by creating an environment where people can basically meet and uh, see innovations that are uh, currently being developed and happening. Thank you for the stage. Thank you very much. Um, plenty of questions already uh, coming up here. Um, Yolanta, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for having me over. Um, my name is Yolanta Glanovka, and I'm a director of learning innovation at IE. 
um, my personal story of education starts uh, uh, somewhere around high school when I uh, when I started teaching uh, English and then Polish when I went to the U.S. and teaching uh, Polish to uh, Polish uh, to, to kids of Polish uh, immigrants uh, in, in the U.S. Um, to rekindle their their abilities in the, in their own language. Um, I I had so professionally started working with the topics of education um, before IE when I spent eight years at McKinsey, the global consulting company. Uh, I have worked there predominantly with topics of uh, leadership development, um, designing both um, training for the internal purposes for our own uh, McKinsey staff, as well as designing uh, courses, uh, designing programs for our clients, uh, for, for external use individual clients or multi-client programs. Um, and this has been my passion and that's why um, I, I've decided to tie my, uh, my career with an educational institution and I've joined IE six years ago. Uh, as a director of learning innovation, I have a privilege to sit somewhere in the middle between the topics of pedagogy and the topics of technology. Uh, so that sounds familiar to a lot of you right now and I'm realizing I have uh, I have some things in common, for example, what Roman said. Um, uh, part of my job is, uh, and, and my, the, the job of my department, is to help weave out the, the startups, uh, the solutions specifically, that are the highest quality and most promising and can have the highest impact on the learning and teaching uh, at our institution. And it is to, to test them and, uh, and, and uh, put them in front of the professors and see how they actually perform in reality. So very much tied up to that. <laughs> um, uh, what we also do, I, I know Melody has mentioned that, that part of the problem we're seeing right now in the market is that we have, um, that startups have a difficult time getting into the institutions and uh, being considered by the institution seriously. So the second part of uh, of what what we do in our department of learning innovation is we uh, we try to take away that problem by rolling out a proverbial or virtual red carpet for their startups and an easier access to um, uh, to be able to be tested. So one of the uh, one of the things that we secure is, for example, we know in a lot of institutions um, a big challenge is the budgeting cycle. Uh, by the time that you have piloted a, a solution, um, a, you need to wait out probably a year and a half before you can finally implement it between budgeting and connection with IT and what else. Uh, so we try to jump ahead of that and uh, pre-reserve uh, budgets for our uh, for, for potential startups, not yet knowing even what startups might come up, but knowing the key challenges that are coming out of the institution and actively looking for the solutions uh, for the solutions out there. Um, predominantly, we, we kind of work with the two sides. On one hand, uh, we do a regular check-in with the organization when we uh, try to source the main, um, the main challenges we see, both from the student perspective, the professor's perspective, so the faculty perspective, and the staff perspective, and try to understand what are the key trends there and key challenges we need to address um, in the process of learning and teaching. And Equipped with that knowledge, we then go out and look for the solutions. Um, we either look for ready uh, off-the-shelf solutions, so working with, uh, with uh, startups that already have something going uh, that is ready, or collaborating and partnering with startups to develop um, solutions or to um, tailor or customize a little bit, adjust their solutions to our specific needs, or in rare occasions when um, things are not available immediately, we, um, uh, we I, I don't want to say build our own solutions entirely from scratch because that wouldn't be true. I would say we build solutions in collaboration with uh, startups that are not necessarily ed tech startups yet. <laughs> um, I have a story here to share one of our big projects from um, that started about three years ago uh, was a wow room. It's a uh, solution for video conferencing that sits somewhere technologically between, for those of you who know Minerva project from a technological platform perspective, and the Harvard Life Studio HyFlex classroom um, from a sort of hardware solution. So it sits somewhere in between 
at the same time being a scalable solution that works of, of any, any form of a hardware package, if you will. Um, I wanted to mention that, that, uh, that specific project because it was one of those uh, weird solutions where we partnered up with a startup that had nothing to do with, uh, with education at that point and pro was a provider for um, health tech, actually, solutions. Um, but their specific uh, technology was particularly interesting to the challenges we were facing. And together with them, we managed to create the original prototype for, the, um, uh, for, for our WOW room, uh, then later partnering with more startups, more advanced to, to, to keep going and, and, and evolving. Uh, in general, we see ourselves as a laboratory. Uh, sometimes we go with a more established, uh, uh, with the most established and tested uh, um, solutions available in the market, but many times we just experiment and dig around. Um, in order to be able to discover uh, what is going to be most helpful to the uh, to to learning and teaching at IE, uh, we not only work with the established things, but also take technologies that uh, are up and coming in general, not yet necessarily fully tested in the area of education, throw them against the educational institution and see what comes up. And sometimes something comes up. Many times uh, we learn that uh, we learn things that don't work, but that in and of its own is a fantastic learning and allows us to keep, keep advancing. Um, so that's more or less the, 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 fun, uh, the fun job that uh, I have a pleasure to have at IE. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Yolanta. There's a couple of questions that are already uh, popping up here. Uh, one is um, whether, and I'll come to Melody and, and Roman in a minute, but um, is whether you're kind of uh, a bit like what Roman is doing with the Collider, whether you also use the kind of li living labs with the startups in, in your setup, or whether it is more kind of focused on uh, bringing in relevant partners to initially uh, fulfill your challenges with then a view to kind of maybe taking it outside. So um, that was a question that kind of popped up. Yeah. If, if I may, I'll answer in a very, very quick fashion to, yeah, that, to that sure. question. We, we, we predominantly focus on challenges that we have internally because we don't have an independent um, uh, collider or accelerator, which, which is focused on all of the institutions externally. But having been said, IE does have its own vehicle, which is IE Rocket. Um, it's a... Um, it, it's a form of an accelerator, more advanced accelerator, post-prototype accelerator, uh, which uh, gives a support that the standard accelerator would do to the startups. However, we select the startups based on our needs. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, Melody, um, you know, it's very interesting to have the three of you actually in, in this in this panel because you've all really got very different contexts and very different approaches and fulfilling very different needs. So from your perspective, uh, Melody, you're kind of a startup that's going straight out to the market um, that is very outward focused, obviously internally focused for your product to get it off the ground, but actually your focus is, you know, out, outward. Um, so what, what would you sort of describe to be your kind of biggest challenges given you know the the kind of fragmentation of the market the proliferation of the market to some extent um so from a you know relatively young startup perspective what would you say is the biggest challenge there for you um so what i would say to put things in, in, in a little bit more background is that when we first thought about bloom initially to be very transparent in our stage one of our product we were aiming for people that are already actively dedicating time to learning already but like executives high performers thought leaders currently using solutions like evernote pocket roam research and then COVID hit and lockdown and we thought oof wait a second, students might um, really be suffering from, from that move uh, fully online to their studies. And that's where we kind of uh, slightly pivoted to our target audience to start with, because we thought maybe those are the most in need of a solution right now as it stands. So by running sort of more than hundreds of interviews with higher education students, we realized that they needed definitely support and help around their studies online so examples is that they could um, they found it really difficult to collaborate 
online and share things online for these um you know first year students who don't maybe year one students imagine they've never met in person and they're they're asked to do that group work and group project or maybe having the right tools to interconnect their their thinking and learning and then we, we've discovered way more other problems around lack of focus distractions and and all of, of that these things so what are the challenges now to um, reach those students and get bloom into their hands. I would say, um, yes, getting access to the students is quite a tricky one because it's either super organic and you just manage to get the attention of, of a student, have that 25 minute call where you just ask the questions to understand their, their pain points, then you show them the project and then you either see light in their eyes like, oh my gosh, can, can I start using this? And you're like, okay, maybe we're definitely solving one of their pain points, if not more. And um, and uh, that, yeah, that's what's happened uh, so far a little bit. And then we, of course, ask them to tell their friends and their other students about it. But if you um, then think, okay, how can we get Bloom into the hands of more students? Well, you think, well, via the lecturer, that would be a logical way to do this. And then lecturer are like, Oh, I've already got my own tools and my way of doing things. Why would I want this? So we've got one actually that really um, loved Bloom and created a whole shared lab with there for the, for the students. But it's a bit of a yeah, a, a one off. I mean, uh, yes, uh, a different use case, but it, that can very well work. Or they just recommend it to their students, which is a pilot that's been running in university in France, where they said, oh he's asked his students this work you have to do it using bloom and so he had all his students on bloom and then deliver their work and that that was extremely successful because it was the, the perfect tool for that specific work he was asking for for those students that had to work in groups of two three or four and lastly you're like to go even more top down via the faculty and the university and that's where it becomes very tricky because what we heard so far from our conversations is, and actually, uh, Yolanda, you did mention that. Well, it's you, you, you did use the word connection with IT. So that's what comes up a lot. It's like, wait a second, can you integrate? Can you integrate in our current systems? Because we've already got all of that. So wait, are you saying you're gonna be another tech solution because Bloom is built as a standalone web-based solution for the learners. So you're like, oof, yeah, how does that work with institutions? And, um, and it's true, it's not in our plans to, to integrate with an enterprise solution or institution solution. So, so that's what it's become really tricky to get uh, in the hands of, of students, in many students in one go, let's put it this way. And I would mention the last point is that we've also heard, and again, it's, you, there are a lot of um, uh, people here in the audience who could confirm or not, but that above a certain year at uni, they want to keep their students, which I understand why, the reason why, um, away from Google and have them more on academic papers, research papers, and having some more you know, uh, deep academic work, which I think has already got tremendous tech solutions for that work and referencing and this and that. So, so that's where then maybe Bloom is, is, is more for a mix and match of formal and informal learning space. And that's where we need to know where we belong. Yeah. Okay. All right. All right. It's, it's quite interesting how COVID actually made you pivot um yeah. because that's happened to quite a lot of people so roman if i come to you um you know there's obviously the COVID dimension to a collider which kind of throws the whole model around a little bit um and also um i've, I've kind of got two questions for you is your collider very focused on switzerland or is it international and then also you know what this has that meant then with COVID coming in and what challenges has that presented for you absolutely happy to answer those questions carla so Indeed, you know, at the base, uh, hence also the name Swiss EdTech Collider is uh, mostly aimed, you know, to help with the transformation or the digital transformation education from public schools to higher education to private schools here in Switzerland. But, you know, all those tools, you know, they, they can be implemented also in, in, in other countries. Unless, you know, the uh, EdTech startup uh, specifically has targeted the Swiss curriculum 
which then it would probably not make sense. So would it make maybe a little bit more difficult to be integrated in another curriculum outside of Switzerland? But those startups basically are versatile. So uh, we not only have Swiss startups, by the way, that are members of the Swiss at the Collider. So I would say 85% are Swiss-based startups, 15% are from outside. We actually have five uh, only based in, in Paris or based in Paris only. So uh, we are growing also uh, across, across the borders and um, startups from us based in Switzerland, they also uh, offer their uh, solutions to uh, to other countries than just Switzerland. So that was uh, hopefully that answered your first first question. The second question, COVID came in. Yes, absolutely. I mean, everyone at this uh, round table here knows um, how it felt, what implications it had. Um, I have to say that depending in which area the startups, you know, worked, it actually was a boost for them because uh, startups that offering that were offering uh, distance learning solutions, for example, they were basically overrun overnight. We had startups that usually had 300 teachers using their platforms. The next morning when uh, the lockdown came with schools, they have 4,000 teachers suddenly, you know, at the same time simultaneously using the platform, which per se, I wouldn't call it a luxury problem, but posed a problem to those startups because they couldn't keep up you know, in, in the back end. So they were completely overrun. But on the other hand, of course, startups, you know, selling uh, physical products or tools in classroom interaction, you know, uh, with, with students and teachers, they had uh, more a hard time to, to, to offer those products. But in general, I would say, you know, the whole um, pandemic at the end of the day, don't get me wrong, but maybe pushed edtech now on a at least on a virtual or visual plate you know to the schools and also to educational institutions where they see the need to start at least thinking about implementing something because uh, you know the a lot of schools no offense um you know they they uh, are sitting on this opinion oh our system runs why do we have to change anything but what they do forget is that, you know, the, uh, the, the skills needed in, in 10 years might be completely different than what we teach today. So that might pose a problem. So in, in the end, you know, this COVID-19 situation has influenced uh, the, the landscape in education technology in a way that it is more being discussed. And also now, and thanks what Melody said, you know, uh, being an investor or investing in, in, in startups, basically. So far, big investors, there are a handful of, of edtech investment uh, vehicles out there, more in uh, the United States and in Asia, but specifically here in Europe, it's comparably still scarce. So when you go there and say like FinTech, Biotech, MedTech, SpaceTech, whatever tech, they jump on you. But when you say EdTech, they go at what? So you still have to explain. And I think that changed as well in a positive way. Yeah, I, I agree with, with you on that one, uh, Roman. Um, Yolanta, um, obviously um, your challenges are very, very different from, from Roman's. Uh, but one of the things I picked up uh, that Roman said was, you know, the need for skills development. And now I'm kind of seeing in some markets a bit of a trend uh, that is accelerating in terms of potentially EdTech moving from K-12 market to or the curricular based markets or solutions to skills development uh, solutions. And uh, because obviously that is uh, very recognized and I think COVID has kind of amplified that as well. How, how does that fit in with what you're doing? Um, uh, absolutely, I think curriculum, as you said, curriculum based uh, solutions are, are very tricky in, in many ways. And I think there's been, um, if anything for the higher education, I would say a certain level of um, distrust also of the curriculum-based solutions. And that's principally because a solution that um, gives back to an academia um, content, educational content, seems to be seen as a competitive practically solution, right? Because uh, academia likes to believe that we have the 
uh, all of the knowledge inside. That's why we are research institutions, not just teaching institutions. And so hence we want to create, create the knowledge. Um, so so that, that, that has always been seen with a little bit of a suspicion, especially I would say by the faculty, not just by the institutions in general, but especially by the faculty part. So I think for, for an academic institution, the skill focus has been something from the beginning, probably of the highest interest. Um, as you said, COVID um, probably intensified it, but I would say it just intensified an overall need for for um, for technical for technology based solutions for teaching right and I would say here I know we talked about the switch to online um, but I want to mention an additional switch and I think that's the switch to hybrid not every school have chosen to go online or have chosen to go online for some periods of time I think a lot of institutions I included have chosen to also go the middle path which is trying to um, enable educational experience where you have the students some of the students on campus physically in a classroom and others connected to the same session, to the same classroom uh, remotely. And that requires multiple, multiple different changes. Obviously, there's changes to the overall structure of the course. You cannot have the same quantity of live teaching because it's not the same to go through six hours of a uh, live instruction as it is to go through six hours of Zoom. Uh, it's obviously a very different, very different experience. You need to chop things up. You need to exchange some of it for more self-paced or group work or what have you. Um, and for that part that you are transforming, education um, uh, technology, educational technology is critical. Because obviously, in order to manage in a good way and create a worthwhile experiences in that asynchronous or semi-synchronous format, you absolutely need good technology. And I think that that's where, where the solutions that Roman has, for example, mentioned that, that now you know are sort of surging up are very are very helpful beyond obviously the virtual classroom solution. Um, to me, and, and I think to, to Ayn that, that sense, when we chose the hybrid part, I think one of the biggest challenges was to find technologies that can be used in a hybrid format because no one has thought of that format. There were already startups that were working on the online world. There were startups that were working on the offline world, but no one was conceiving of this weird monster of a classroom with some online students, some offline students, and it's not trivial. There is a lot to consider there. Um, and I think we, we, in terms of our challenge where we are right now, is taking some of the solutions we've been using before and um, uh, changing the protocol of use <laughs> of those solutions so that they can work in that hybrid space. Um, and then it's seeking out additional solutions that, that that directly address the challenges of that weird world. Um, because if, if you think about it, that weird world isn't going in, uh, anywhere anytime soon. Um, even if we if, even if we move into the world of with vaccines and what have you, it's going to be years before you're going to be able to reincorporate all of your students back on campus. Obviously, assuming that that's even something you want to do. Uh, or assuming that's something that's going to be possible in the long term, because it's entirely possible that as we go forward in a few years, uh, once the model is fully grounded and fully resourced with adjusted versions of the of the of the edtech startup uh, edtech solutions, um, there are no new startups that that start providing solutions for the for the hybrid world. Um, at that point, maybe we will not be moving away from it, even though we don't have to <laughs> stay anymore in a hybrid world, because I think that might, that might be addressing some new, some new needs in the market as well. Yes, thank you. I've got a, another question then, which, um, you know, because uh, Yolanta, you kind of highlighted the sort of the hybrid model and, and what potentially could come out of that. And one of the things that I'm kind of very interested in is sort of um, a co-creation of learning between students, uh, lecturers or teachers and startups. Um, so that actually the dynamics of, you know, you being talked at uh, as a student is changing to a kind of much more of a dialogue between these different stakeholders. Can you see that? And that's a question for all three of you. And I, I think Melody, for you, that question probably has a slightly different slant, but um, can you see models like that emerging and uh, sort of contribute to the in innovation of education? Uh, absolutely. Oh, if absolutely. I might, uh, 
Or go, should go I say ahead, yeah, ladies ahead, first? Brother. Okay, thank no, you. No, go ahead. Sorry. Okay. No, no, I would say absolutely. I think I would love to have this approach because that is key, you know, to bring all the stakeholders uh, to one to one table. Because that is, you know, as you know, startups think often they have the solution, right? And they go out with their solution because it's their baby. Of course, they want to to make it work. But at the and then eventually they realized, oh, there is basically there is no need is there or uh, oh why didn't I have talked to teachers and students beforehand uh, because then we could have co-created something that works for everyone and all of us would be happy and then it would also probably most likely be easy to implement that so that's why uh, you know one of the ideas is to bring startups together with students and teachers and to have co uh, create, for example, workshops or co-create lessons, you know, and then see how it works. And this is a learning, uh, you know, um, a situation for, for all of the involved parties. And this is where, you know, the, also the, uh, the, the anxiety that most likely teachers have to, to implement a new technology uh, can be smoothened out a little bit because when they use it together with the startup, which are the specialists and that together with basically the end users, which are the students, that creates an environment of, I uh, wouldn't want to say safety, but of, uh, of, of co-creation that emphasizes the need to have all these parties around the table. Yeah. So that is certainly an approach we wish to, to see more uh, from the point of view of the Swiss at the Collide, you know, schools opening their doors and they say like, hey, come in. And, and maybe, you know, like Melody said, you know, we, we have this solution, but we might slightly pivot it and then everyone is happy at the end of the day. So this is how it would work. Yeah, I, I, I couldn't agree more. And that's exactly how we've decided to, to go about how we're building our product. And, and that's why I'm, I'm so thrilled to be part of, of this group here um, with the EdTech Network in the sense that we want co-creators. We don't want to do that in our little corner and then say, okay, who wants to use our product? We're actually now, as Milena said, in, in sort of research and development phase, we want power users that are adopting our product, not because we're forcing them to use it, but because they find it's really solving their pain points and there's a need for it. And then from there, have them as power users and get their feedback so we can really inform our product decisions and how can we, what features need to be developed or prioritized and are going to come top of the list because I don't know how many of our uh, learners ask for that specific features. So it's totally yeah, about co-creation. So do you see um, kind of more of a, an approach creeping in where, where students kind of collaborate much more together using Bloom um, than, than they maybe do now? Yes, yeah. absolutely. That's the idea because um, if they discuss content in a very seamless fashion, they would do more of that discussion and collaboration. Yeah. And so it's really developing those, um, the skills that we we're trying to help them with. Yeah. So you're addressing some of the soft skills surreptitiously, <laughs> yes. Absolutely, yeah. because yeah. then you develop, crit uh, yes, critical thinking skills because you yeah. can question the content you're, you're, you're going through and, and all of these good things, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yolanta, can we yeah. have your perspective, please? Absolutely. I'll echo the same, um, exactly the same as Roman and Melody have said. Two of our most successful, some of our most successful um, collaborations with startups are exactly based on that uh, deeply collaborative model. In both of them, we, um, I think that model, first of all, maybe before I explain, um, addresses some of the challenges from an educational institution perspective. So we've said, you know, one of it is you don't know which startups are, are, are the, the, the best ones. <laughs> Um, there's a lot out there. And I think one of the big challenges from, from our perspective is we have a lot of startups come and pitch to us, which are started by students. Um, and with all the best intentions, they come and they say, we know education because we were students. And I say, that's fantastic. And I totally take on board your, your needs. But for something to work in educational institution has to be more than just working for students. It has to work also for the institution, for the faculty, for the IT department, as we mentioned, and for a lot of other stakeholders. So the, the, the most successful collaborations we've had were the ones where even though they were started by students, um, they were completely open to having 
to receiving the needs from the rest of the of the institution and understanding that their perspective as students from one institution don't necessarily have to be replicated in all the other institutions. And there might be slightly different needs from one institution to another. So I wanted to mention two relationships we have, um, one which is creating a, um, it's a, it's a startup that, that is building a, um, if you will, a type of an LMS, I would say. It's a, um, it's a content sort of delivery, delivery platform, and one which is with a, another startup that is a plugin that allows you to do a whole host of very many different um, activities, um, either asynchronously or synchronously in the class, uh, in a simple way allows you allows the professor to plug in uh, questions and chats and what have you different types of again engaging elements on top of um, already pre-existing materials such as PDFs, videos, or whatever the professor is normally normally using. Um, in both of those relationships, we have um, um, we have a, a a stake in the roadmap. So we are. Uh, jointly having discussions. We're part of a sort of smaller group um, of schools that are influencing the roadmap of the of the startup. Obviously, we don't take over the roadmap. That would also not be advisable uh, for any startup, but we do have an influence over the roadmap. Um, we also propose features, um, but we don't just kind of put the features there and they are promoted by others, and then you just leave the features. No, when we propose a feature, we actually dedicate a resource from our institution to work significant number of hours during a, an academic year on the definition of that feature, on testing of that feature, on um, working with the students, working with the professors, improving it, um, and, uh, and making the, the most out of it before it's even released, uh, released further, further out. Um, I also want to mention here there is an additional element that helps with that collaboration. Um, when schools look at that sort of big field of of um, of startups, one of the challenges that they're that they're facing, and definitely something that we see, is which of those startups are going to exist two years from now. Because if I'm going to make all of this effort and I'm going to make all of the professors um, change the way that they're teaching, or my students change the way that they're learning, or whatever else is needed, I'm going to make integrations and everything. I need to know that the startup is going to exist two years down the road because I can't make this investment in. In, in vain. Um, so one of the things that helped us with both of those um, relationships is we have a financial commitment to those and to, to those startups that goes four years in advance. So we are we we signed a contract, which is very unusual if you think about it. In normal world, you don't sign a contract for four years. You sign a contract with the big players. You sign a contract for one year with a one month exit option. But with those startups. Um, because of the initial very good relationship and the ability to influence the remote map, roadmap and their responsiveness to the needs of all of the institution, we commit money four years in advance. And because there is a number of institutions doing the same, we have a much better sense of stability and we know it's worth, we know that the startup will exist four years down the line because there's enough of us paying for that startup. That's also very helpful. I think it kind of goes in a package. I don't think you can do one without doing the other. You need to have the two elements working together. Can I just jump in and thank you for Yolanda for mentioning that because now if I put my investor cap on, I just wanted to raise that to this uh, to this group is that what freaks out investors, just, just so you know, is that if you are not funded or have those, those nailed contracts with your end customers, investors are like okay so what's your business model what's your business plan and very often as Carla said or ideas come from teachers themselves or students and that's what you know investors are really concerned about is financial sustainability not even profitability let's keep that for for you know let's just say financial sustainability to survive and if you don't have that that's why investors don't put a penny into education or a tech is because they don't understand the business models because your your end customer is not your end user so it, it's super complicated as an industry for them first to understand and then to understand where is the money come from so sometimes you've got some super clever models where you have got a consumer product and then you've got a very sound and then for institutions you've got different sort of models so you've got those hybrid business models but yes so, so i think it's, it's it's amazing what you're doing yolanta because if if you have that financial visibility it's super reassuring for the institutions 
and the teachers and the adopters and those who are using the product that they, they make sure it's not going to disappear in uh, in two years time if they have they, if they're not heavily backed by other external investors basically yeah yeah, yeah, and I want to start actually, up so sorry, to spend our ahead, time on improving things. Sorry, I want no, no, the startups that we work with to, to, to spend our time improving the product as opposed to sort of scrambling for debt, for example, in case they don't have you know, enough clients. Obviously, you can't be the only institution investing, but if you have a, um, a, a meaningful number of seriously committed institutions, it suddenly makes sense and it gives that, that breathing space for a startup to really you know, sort of spread their wings and get there um uh, with a meaningful product and by the time you know the sort of three four years period is over um they have enough of a good product to be able to go and sell more broadly even to schools that are a bit more cautious in uh in investing in the sort of earlier stages thank you um i'm conscious of time roman uh sort of to end the session would you like to kind of add something to what melody and and uh, yolanta have said yeah, I would really love the approach of, of Yolanta, you know, that certainly helps, you know, a startup to, uh, to, to plan also better, because those startups are all in a survival mode, specifically in the education industry, as we have discussed at the very early, uh, you know, of this session, um, that it is tricky to get into schools. Um, we were talking about public schools yeah. here, yeah. because private schools are a little bit a different market, because they're in competition with each other. So they are more progressive and more open for innovative uh, products. Uh, so I really like, you know, that there is a model out there that provides a certain financial stability, you know, at least in order to survive for the next two, three years, but also in a co-creation environment. So the school, the institution actually helps the startups to further refine and develop, you know, their tool so that it can be basically market proof, which helps then at the end of the day, as Melody said, to find a uh, more investment or more uh, next investment rounds. Yeah. What I just wanted to add at one point is that, you know, we're all talking about education, education technology uh, and stuff. So one thing that I want to make clear, EdTech is not here to replace any teachers. On the contrary, EdTech yeah. is here to help teachers and support students you know, to, to, uh, to make things maybe faster, better, easier, because, um, you know, education technology is, is not the magical cure, but it opens us opportunities and possibilities that we have never had. We were touching, you know, slightly on the hybrid model. Nobody knows exactly how that looks like, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking about virtual reality, virtual reality rooms where you can virtually meet together and co-create stuff. So, um, but at the end of the day, you know, ed, ed tech is providing us more opportunities and possibilities than we used to have or have also nowadays uh, for the future. But one thing is clear, it will never replace the soft skills, uh, that, uh, you know, or, or, or any person. We need those uh, soft skills more than ever to prevail uh, against computers and robots in the future because these guys will will do math pretty quicker than we do i i would like to yeah. say yeah. absolutely i think we're all in agreement there i think uh, yolanta raised a, a very interesting and important point um, education is a very risk adverse sector incredibly risk adverse what you're doing with you know your model of supporting those startups for you know four years or um, you know, having that sort of looking at the future and the sustainability is obviously taking a risk. And I think, you know, unless we start taking more risk, we're not going to get there. So I'd like to end on this, unless uh, any of you wants to add something, because I'm, I'm aware that, you know, you've all got uh, other meetings to go to. Uh, but thank you so much for, for being here. Uh -huh.